Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Chit Heads. My guest today is Andrea Jane. Andrea is Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, editor of the Journal of American Academy of Religion, and author of Selling Yoga from Counterculture to Pop Culture, which we'll talk about today. She received her doctorate degree in religious studies from Rice University in 2010. Her areas of research include religion in late capitalist society, South Asian religions, the history of modern yoga, the intersections of gender, sexuality, and religion, and methods and theories in the study of religion. She is a regular contributor to religion dispatches on topics related to yoga in contemporary culture and co-chair of the Yoga in Theory and Practice group of the American Academy of Religion. So hello, Andrea. Thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to be here. So I'm really excited to talk about your book, which I thought was a very um, refreshing take on a variety of different topics related to contemporary postural yoga. But before we jump into that, I'd love to just hear a little bit about, you know, the story of your own research and what has led you to this scholarly interest in, in postural yoga and kind of the modern yoga scene in general. Sure. So I was interested going into graduate school in actually the psychosexual dimensions of mm -hmm. devotional traditions in South Asia. So I was interested in Hindu bhakti, yeah. uh, devotional tradition, devotional yoga. And I was planning to do, write a dissertation on devotion to Krishna mm. uh, and adopting a sort of psychoanalytical approach. And I went to India as a graduate student and really by accident sort of stumbled upon a modern yoga tradition uh, in the Jain tradition. Right. And the Jains are known for being, you know, the most ascetic of yeah. uh, the South Asians. And this particular sect of Jainism is really known as the most radical in terms of asceticism of even the Jains. Mm. Um, yet, the current guru of this tradition, uh, the Jain Shwetambara Tarapunt, he taught a rendition of yoga uh, that I found really resonated with the larger global yoga industry insofar as it treated the body not as an obstacle to spiritual progress, but as a tool, uh, uh, as something that was important that we should enhance the health of the body Beautify, beautify the body, uh, attend to the needs of the body as a step towards spiritual perfection. And so this uh, kind of accident of stumbling upon this yoga tradition in, in Rajasthan uh, really sucked me into the modern yoga world because I became fascinated by, you know, how could something that uh, comes from a tradition that is so radically uh, anti-body uh, be you know, produce a, a yoga practice that is very affirmative when it comes to the value of the body. And uh, so it led me to ask bigger questions about the relationship between religion and society and religious change over time in relation to shifts in social norms. Uh, but also, more specifically, uh, questions about the yoga industry and modern yoga and its relationship to larger social trends, such as the rise of capitalism, globalization, and consumer culture. Yeah. So, yeah, that gives you just a bit of background. You know, I wrote the dissertation. It was deeply up there, ethnographic about this particular school of modern yoga. And then the book was, uh, you know, kind of shrunk the ethnography and expanded the theory and made this particular school of yoga one case in a larger set of case studies um, that I looked at in order to kind of theorize and understand uh, modern yoga as a larger global movement. Excellent. So I like that you start the book on the talk, topic of a Jain community because your last name is Jane, ironically, and, and you had sort of a humorous anecdote about, um, you know, encountering Jain teachers who essentially d almost were implying that it was sort of written and you couldn't escape it. So will you talk a little bit about that? Because I thought that was really great. Yeah, sure. So I, uh, you know, yeah, my last name is Jane. My father is South Asian. He uh, married my mother, who was a white Midwesterner uh, with a Christian background. And I was raised uh, Protestant, uh, kind of loosely Protestant. Mm -hmm. And 
I, uh, it was interesting because in my field research as a graduate student, yeah, I was oftentimes treated by my subjects as Jane, as an insider. Hmm. And when I, you know, felt compelled to, um, you know, assert my non-insider status, my outsider status and say, well, I'm not Jane, you know, I'm Jane, but not Jane, yeah. right? <laughs> Jane. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I have this heritage, but I'm not a practicing Jane. I, I was sort of laughed at and it was really interesting because for them, this was silly, you know, like my karma was something that was be out of, beyond my control yeah. and that I was, you know, in this situation for a reason, for reasons that were, you know, far beyond my, uh, you know, immediate purposes and intents. Uh, and so it created an interesting dynamic of sort of neither outsider nor insider, but sort of this kind of other, um, this kind of other type. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, moving into the book, you know, um, my initial I, I encountered your work initially actually through an article that actually Matthew Remsky shared with me, um, which was a response to another article that had been written on the topic of cultural appropriation. And so then I, I, I got a chance to read your book. And initially, you know, when I saw it selling yoga and I saw the front of it, I sort of thought, oh, this is going to be another kind of, um, you know, um, tearing apart of the postural yoga or, or modern yoga industry. And it's really not that at all. You know, it's a very nuanced and balanced kind of consideration of of um, of this, you know, evolving tradition. And, um, and so, uh, you know, I would love to hear a little bit about kind of what, you know, led you to kind of initially writing the book and maybe just situating the book in terms of um, at least, uh, I guess, in a w talking about it in relation to uh, history that we're at now, like the modern yoga history, because you start sort of from there. Yeah, so, um, so if I could just clarify the question, are you asking me to kind of contextualize the book project? Yeah, you know, sorry, that was a little bit of a confusing. Yeah, contextualize the book project, and then we'll segue into the history. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so I was not interested in writing um, a real ethical critique of the yoga industry. At, at this stage in my work, I was interested more in just understanding, you know, how did yoga go from being something that was radically countercultural? Mm -hmm. uh, yoga has historically been something that really challenged and, and transgressed uh, many social norms and um, institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's the case in South Asia, even for the kind of ascetics who didn't, you know, rejected society and rejected status and instead became kind of occupational religionists, people who were, you know, in pursuit for the rest of their lives of spiritual enlightenment and liberation. Um, as well as for even lay devotees who practiced yoga, yoga itself, um, even though open to, you know, everyday practitioners, uh, in many ways was radically egalitarian mm -hmm. um, in some forms, right? In some forms, like, for example, in the devotional uh, traditions, many people could practice, for example, bhakti yoga, no matter your status or gender. And... Uh, and so it has this sort of subversive uh, tendency, yoga does, to kind of subvert, a, 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 a especially uh, social authoritarian institutions. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and then, you know, in, mo in early modern yoga, yoga becomes a mode for both uh, Hindu revolution against empire, uh, you know, H Hindus appropriated yoga as a way to challenge uh, the British Empire in India yeah. uh, as a way to kind of claim strength and independence for Hindus in opposition to the British Empire. And then in, uh, in you know, the British American counterculture, the hippies appropriate yoga as a way to counter mainstream values and norms. Uh, and so there's this sort of historical countercultural dimension to yoga, and then it becomes all of a sudden a part of pop culture. You know, the, today in the 21st century, you can't get uh, some, you know something much more mainstream than yoga. Exactly. So the, the book is really premised on that question. You know, how did yoga go from something that was 
generally countercultural to something that was a part of pop culture. And so that led me to look at the intersections between yoga or the yoga industry and consumer culture. And I argue that um, in the late 20th century, yoga entrepreneurs tapped into mainstream uh, consumer cultural trends uh, by you know, making yoga something that was readily accessible, that was easy to consume and combine with other spiritual products and physical practices. And this is what enabled it to um, enter into pop culture. Mm -hmm. And what would you see, would you say that in order to do that, they sort of downplayed the more transgressive components of, um, of the yoga tradition? And, and if so, what were the, what were some of those uh, components? Yeah. So I think that, um, for example, yoga no longer required a person to renounce society. Um, you know, traditionally, you know, to study yoga as a serious practitioner required that a person at least temporarily leave society to go to an ashram mm -hmm. and study with a teacher. Yeah. And in the late 20th century, uh, teachers left the ashram and went out into the world, into society to teach. And so, so, so transmission was flipped, right? No longer did the student have to go to the teacher in the isolated ashram outside of society, but rather the teachers went into society, went into the cities and, and, and wrote paperback books, right. And made their teachings accessible to the students. Yeah. 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 So, so, you know, let's segue a little bit into, um, one of the things that I think is a real highlight of your book, which is considering postural yoga as a body of religious practice, which I feel like is not something that has been done or, or really is taken seriously because there's so much, um, resistance to that, right, from from what we might call maybe more fundamentalist or conservative or essentializing um, arguments about or positions about yoga's origins. So, you know, let's kind of set that up. So how do you see, what, what kind of inspired you to feel the need to establish postural yoga as a body of religious practice in your, in this text? Yeah, I think that there is a sort of uh, tendency to write off uh, yoga as not serious, yeah. as not a, a, a sort of complicated social phenomenon in which you find communities and rituals and beliefs and commitments uh, to particular worldviews. And I think that 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 the yoga the yoga world, even commercial yoga, constitutes not just uh, you know, a sort of consumer uh, trend, but also a very complex body of religious practice, meaning that we find among people practicing yoga, uh, shared commitments, shared communities, and shared rituals. And I think if we, we recognize these things in the industry, then we'll see how uh, not just the yoga industry, but other spiritual industries serve not to replace religion, but they function as new religious movements, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and we can much more deeply understand religion in contemporary society if we study these various movements alongside more traditional religious institutions. Right. So um, I want to talk a little bit later about your uh, latest work, which is talking about this kind of spiritual but not religious um, movement. But uh, but it just is sort of before we get there, because a lot of people would sort of describe their yoga practice, and you remark on this in the book, of course, that, you know, yoga is different from a traditional kind of religious institution. Um, uh, it's actually spiritual and but not religious. So, you know, what are we doing to the word religion when we're opening it up to accommodate um, something like yoga, postural yoga as as a form of religious uh, or for, as a form of a religious movement? Yeah, I think that we're breaking from uh, inherited Protestant notions of religion. Yeah. Uh, when we, uh, you know, use yo use the term religion to talk about, for example, popularized yoga. Yeah. Uh, 
religion religion is oftentimes thought of in the popular imagination as a shared commitment to a set of beliefs mm -hmm. or doctrines and then the history of religions that's just not the case mm -hmm. uh, for some religious communities identity with that community is dependent on a shared set of doctrines or beliefs but for many religious people throughout the history of religions, uh, commitment and identity to a, with, a, with a particular community is as much about shared practice yeah. uh, as it is about shared belief. And so it's what you do, not what you believe, that makes you a part of, particular, of a particular community. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that you know, we're be, you know, really doing a disservice to the study of religion generally when we we perpetuate this very Protestant notion of religion, um, and certainly a disservice to our understanding of religion in contemporary society. Uh, again, you know, we can we can make much more progress to understanding religion in society if we think of religion as more complex than just about just being about shared belief. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mentioned earlier that I had found you uh, based on this article that you wrote in response to um, another article. And, and and so when we're as we're talking about, you know, the modern postural yoga movement as being a body of religious practice, people are going to, you know, immediately run to this what's becoming a very common refrain. Well, but but modern postural yoga is cultural appropriation. And and actually in this article, didn't they essentially argue ultimately that yoga belongs to Indian women only? <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. I mean, I don't think they meant for it to be that exclusive. <laughs> I mean, they did say that, that yoga belongs to Indian women, which, which really doesn't make any historical sense. Right. But I, I don't think that was their point. I think, yeah. um, I think they were trying to get at a larger point, which is that Indian women are the ones who are done the, the most disservice. Mm when yoga is appropriated irresponsibly. Right. Uh, because what happens is, you know, Indian women are, um, are, you know, basically treated merely as tools for, uh, you know, making uh, larger industries or corporations or products authentic. Oh. Uh, and, 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 and they, you know, th those who are the conduits of yoga are not, you know, reaping any benefits yeah. Um, yeah. except for to be exploited as just symbols mm -hmm. and gestures. And uh, and so I, I, I their, their, their argument was more nuanced, but it came across as very simplistic. And this is what I was kind of pushing back against is this attempt to sort of essentialize yoga in the way that we say it belongs to this group or it belongs to that group or this is the authentic yoga and that is not many times the kind of critiques of appropriate appropriations of yoga offer up just one more essentialist vision of yoga right um, that makes yoga that much more easier to contain and uh, commodify and buy and sell yeah uh, and so that was my critique of the article was that that yes appropriation is oftentimes exploitative and based on popular stereotypes, um, and therefore is sort of continuing a sort of colonial logic, right? Ex extract from the colonized people what is valuable without extending any benefit to the colonized people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's certainly a problem, but our pushback against appropriation cannot entail a sort, a sort of claim to authenticity. Yeah. Because anytime we claim that we own or ha have claim to the authentic original yoga, then again, we're making yoga something that's easier to contain and sell. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yoga is just com more complex than that. Yeah. So let me ask a general question, and I think you're kind of answering it, but I want to just ask this more uh, kind of pointedly, which is, you know, in your book, you know, anybody that reads it can see that part of the argument is sort of is hinging upon this, you know, observation that appropriation just in the in the unkind of um uh in the in in the meaning of that word just generally not the 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 hyper heated 
in, uh, interpretation of that word. That's just the order of the day, right? Cultures appropriate each other, and there's a kind of uh, exchange and interaction, and there are no self-enclosed static cultures that can kind of you know steal from each other's essential nature in that sort of superficial sense. So then what are we worrying about? Like how do we – what is the bad kind of cultural appropriation, and how do we – how do we see it or how do we witness it without kind of slipping into these essentializing gestures? Yeah, I, um, that's, that's a really good question. And, um, I think that all acts of appropriation and commodification, uh, entail, uh, power dynamics, right? And so we, uh, the, the fact is that the history of yoga and the history of culture more generally is the history of appropriation. You know, human communities have always appropriated from other communities past and present in their acts of constructing new cultural products, ideas, movements, and such. That said, there are always power dynamics at play. Uh, mm-hmm. And you have, those who are in a greater position of power, for example, colonizers, uh, who are appropriating from the colonized. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a long history of colonialism in India, whereby um, the British colonized India and Westerners uh, appropriated from India freely without consideration of the power dynamics at play. Yeah. And so I think that there is a difference between um, you know, mere appropriation without consideration about the power dynamics and appropriation while being critically reflective about and concerned about power dynamics and the ways in which the appropriation and commodification of yoga extends benefits to some uh, while uh, you know, uh, exploiting or not benefiting, um, others. And there are many yoga practitioners who have been very sensitive to this power dynamic and history of colonialism yeah. and have talked about it openly, have engaged in self-criticism in the sense of, you know, a kind of cr- critical reflection on appropriation and the power dynamics and has, have asked questions like, how can we be a more, uh, a community of equity? You know, and think about, uh, you know, extending the benefits of our practice to those who are more marginalized. What are some of the examples of people kind of, from your point of view, successfully, you know, um, living up to this commitment to equity? Yeah, I think that there's um, a lot of, there are a lot of efforts, for example, uh, among, uh, you know, in the prison yoga movement. To, kind of, to introduce yoga uh, into prison populations among some of the most uh, marginalized among our population. Yeah, you know the prison industrial complex is an, is a inherently a you know deeply racist institution. Yeah, and there have been various attempts to uh, to to use yoga in those environments as an alternative mode of rehabilitation and empowerment. Um, and I, I've seen this in Chicago, for example. Uh, Marshawn Feltis uh, is a yoga teacher. He's not, he not only has gone into the jails in Chicago and taught yoga as a mode of rehabilitation, but he also teaches in uh, you know urban Chicago in uh, marginalized Black communities. Uh, and uh, yoga there is made very readily readily accessible to communities who traditionally haven't had access to yoga yeah. as yeah. a mode of empowerment and healing. Mm. And so I think that those who are um, you know, going into these communities um, as insiders and those who are in, empowering insiders to teach inside of their own communities, you know, th- th- they're the ones who are really making the most impact. And so it's not just about, uh, you know, uh, white privileged people reaching out to underprivileged people, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. white privileged people extending privilege to the underprivileged to teach the underprivileged. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where I see the, the most kind of 
I think, in, in transgressive and uh, really powerful work being done. Yeah, that's excellent work. Okay, so now I want to um, talk a little bit more about kind of going back maybe a little bit to talk about the essentializing of yoga and Hinduism, which you remark in my favorite chapter or talk a lot about in my favorite chapter of your book, which is Yoga Phobia and Hindu Origins, which I think is the it's the final chapter before the conclusion, I think. And yeah. um, and what I love about this chapter is that you show the ways in which um, these two um, these two positions actually end up being bedfellows, which was really refreshing for me personally because first of all, I've encountered both of these groups uh, um, attacking some of our you know stuff, especially when we were doing the Yoga Reconsidered online conference, which featured a lot of the scholars that you actually cite in your book. Um, we had a lot of people. I had a lot of hate mail telling me that, you know, modern yoga was phony yoga and um, and that I should be ashamed of myself for, for giving voice to these people. And then I also have, you know, seen many sort of kind of radical Christians saying that if anybody, you know, meditates on the chakras, that they're going to open the gateway to the devil. So so I have personal experience with both of these positions. So it was a really interesting art um, chapter for me. And so I'd love for you to just talk about that and especially how they end up kind of dovetailing with one another. Okay, great. So yeah, in that chapter, and that really, uh, it's it, it was it was good that that ended up being the last chapter of the book because the the second book is really building on that. Mm. Uh, which so so that chapter argues that uh, we find in both the Hindu origins position the argument that yoga is originally Hindu and belongs to Hindus, and that there is this authentic yoga that's getting corrupted when it becomes appropriated and commodified. Um, so there is something in that argument that really mirrors the argument of what I call the Christian yoga phobic position, which is that uh, you know yoga is essentially Hindu and Christians should not practice yoga because in practicing yoga, you are becoming Hindu and you know, really uh, betraying your Christian commitments. Mm-hmm. Um, so both of these are basically offering up this essentialist vision of yoga, that yoga is Hindu, that yoga entails certain practices and commitments, both ideological and practical, um, and uh, that, that yoga has certain origins. And so they oftentimes appeal to certain texts claiming that you know these represent the origins or authentic uh, teachings of yoga. And the problem is that historically, these arguments are both unfounded. Uh, yoga is historically extremely diverse. Uh, there is no original tradition that we can locate. Uh, there has always been contestation and debate about what proper yoga practice is, and not just among Hindus, but also Buddhists and Jains, and eventually Muslims, and eventually Christians. Uh, so I argue that yoga is culturally South Asian, but does not belong to any particular religion. Mm. And even if we were to say yoga is Hindu, which would be historically inaccurate, even if we were to say that, the Hindu tradition itself is not homogenous. Uh, you know, within Hinduism, you have dozens of different belief systems and practices and uh, yogic systems. So, uh, so I. You know, I make the argument that basically these both represent fundamentalist positions, you know, mm-hmm. arguments for the fundamentals of a tradition, which are not historical arguments, rather they're political ones. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're arguing on behalf of, you know, the, you know, privileging and empowering a particular community over others. Yeah, yeah. So, um, what, and one thing I actually really liked, this is just sort of a tangential, but um, I can't remember who exactly wrote it, but... It was one of the Christian guys who is remarking that that America was becoming full of Hindus. And I laughed and thought, that sounds fantastic. I mean, it was essentially because his his idea of Hindu was really just religious pluralists, you know, people that were open yeah. to other people having alternative conceptions of divinity. I was like, that sounds fantastic. And this Christian yeah. is you know, denigrating it as sort of like the decline of civilization as we know it. Yeah, um, so, that was Albert Muller, yeah. yeah. So what is the polythetic, polythetic or polythetic approach? Polythetic. Polythetic approach to the study of religion. Yeah. So I use this way to talk about yoga. Polythetic means that there are multiple characteristics, none of which are essential. Mm. 
but many of which are prototypical. So that means that you find certain prototypical qualities, common qualities among yoga practitioners across various traditions, but you can't point at one particular essence. So for example, a prototypical quality of yoga traditions would be uh, an attempt to unite consciousness to ultimate reality, right? So yoga is a system for becoming aware of the truth, mm-hmm. of the real. Um, for but 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 the techniques involved and what the real entails is going to vary dramatically across yoga traditions. Yeah. yeah. So um, so yoga often entails certain body practices, especially practices that involve uh, you know conditioning consciousness in a way that controls the body, right? Uh, an attempt to enforce control over the body. But again, you know, what control over the body looks like and the practices that that requires, whether it's seated meditation or the modern postures uh, or postural sequences, that's going to vary across yoga and t- traditions. But oftentimes there's some kind of cultivation of control over the body. So those are the prototypical qualities, but the details are, uh, you know, various across traditions. Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. what a, what I mean when I talk about a, a polythetic definition. We're looking for something that talks about prototypical qualities without essentializing yoga. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, one uh, sort of expanding upon something we've talked a lot about already, you know, a lot of the scholars that are in your um, that are cited in your book are, you know, we might say on the blacklist um, of some somebody that we might say is in, I don't know, the Hindu fundamentalist camp or this Hindutva movement. Um, for example, Wendy Doniger, who you cite, David Gordon White, Mark Singleton. Um, so, you know, we were talking a little bit before we started this conversation. I was remarking that your book might be deemed, you know, illegitimate just for the fact, just based on the fact that you were citing these scholars. And I know a lot of that, um, the kind of... Uh, fire behind that uh, movement against certain kinds of scholarship, Western scholarship is being um, the few, it's being fueled by this guy, Rahiv Maholtra, who oftentimes has has some really seemingly, seemingly sound arguments, but also tends to like, tends to inspire a lot of people to be, you know, trolls on the internet and very outraged. (laughs) So do you have any thoughts on, you know, on, Rahiv, I remember I was sort of reading your book, kind of thinking I hoped he would come up at some point because I just wanted to, I wanted to read your your critiques of his position. So, do you have any thoughts on that in relation to what we're talking about? Yeah. So, um, Mahotra has asked me to speak to him, and I have chosen not to because I don't feel like he's capable of critical engagement. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On the topic of yoga or Hindu traditions. Um, my experience of him has been that he is, uh, you know, very closed off to critical thinking. He doesn't want to hear that there are a variety of Hindu traditions. Yeah. Um, he clings very strongly to this idea that uh, there is, you know, one essentialized notion of Hinduism and uh, that there is an authentic school of Hinduism. And so his anger with many scholars of Hindu traditions is rooted in uh, this idea that, you know, they're talking about schools of Hindu tradition that are not authentic or, mm-hmm. or um, legitimate. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I just am, you know, radically opposed to, opposed to the very premise with which he approaches uh, Hindu traditions. Mm-hmm. You know, he also has a long history of attacking those in my own academic lineage. Uh, You know, most closely Jeffrey Kripal, who is my own uh, graduate school mentor and remains a close friend. So uh, he was attacked by Maholtra for his work on Ramakrishna. Yeah. Yeah. And and Wendy Doniger, who was Jeff's teacher, um, has been attacked by Maholtra for you know various projects on the Hindu tradition. So, so for both personal reasons, because of you know my own personal 
closeness <laughs> to these individuals who have been um, on the receiving end of uh, Maholcher's attacks, as well as my professional commitments in, with regard to the study of religion. Um, you know, I can't speak to Maholtra. Um, instead, I can only speak about him. Yeah. Uh, I've uh, again, you know, I find his position, you know, basically a fundamentalist one yeah. and an authoritarian one. I'm not interested in an attempt to dictate what is authentic Hinduism. Instead, I'm interested in understanding the relationship between religion and society. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that requires a kind of deep, I think, recognition that religion is what humans make it. Mm. Um, and religion reflects uh, different communities' needs and desires. Uh, and there is no, you know, one authentic tradition. Thank you for remarking on that. <laughs> uh, so let's talk a little bit about your recent book, or not your recent book, excuse me. It's a ne the next book um, that is, uh, is expanding upon, essentially, you said, what you um, discuss in your the last chapter on Hindu origins and and Christian yoga, the Christian yoga phobia. Um, and you, you mentioned this as being the the politics of the not religion but spiritual or spiritual but not religious movement. So you want to uh, unpack that for us? Yeah, so it's interesting to me that generally the spiritual but not religious, these people, which is it's a growing phenomenon, yeah. which has been documented, for example, by the Pew Forum, uh, which is – uh, you know, studied religion and public life and argued that, you know, the, the SBNR, uh, the spiritual but not religious, uh, is, is a way of self-identifying, is on the rise. Yeah. Um, now, the, 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 the shortcomings of the Pew Forum is, for example, that they ask people to identify as spiritual but not religious. So spiritual is a negation of religion. So you can be spiritual, you can be religious, but you can't be both. Right. Um, and I think that's a major shortcoming that I try to address in my current book project, because I think that uh, the spiritual people are deeply religious. Yeah. Uh, they're just not affiliated. Yeah. Um, and so um, so that's one thing I try to address. The other thing is the more explicitly political issue, which is that uh, the spiritual but not religious has been largely theorized by scholars of religion as generally politically liberal. Yeah. And uh, I think this is also uh, a, a consequence of a kind of focus on North America in, in theorizing that the spiritual but not religious as if this is a North American or Western phenomenon. But I think it also is just a lack of nuance in terms of how we think about politics. So what I try to do in this book project is look at the ways in which uh, the spiritual but not religious movement in many ways gestures toward liberal values. For example, what I mean by liberal is, uh, you know, things like a concern with the environment, a concern with social inequity. And I, um, I look at the ways in which there are many gestures toward these concerns, but there's very little action. Uh, in the sense of, you know, political activism attempts to sort of subvert and change the dominant social system yeah. Uh, yeah. so that inequity is challenged and subverted. So um, I, I look at two different kind of extremes of this in what I call global spirituality, because I think it's not just North American. Uh, there is the kind of explicitly right wing, uh, racist and... Uh, frequently homophobic dimension of this, which you find, for example, among uh, the current prime minister of India, Narendra Modi, and the, his uh, political party, the BJP, mm -hmm. which is behind the uh, international movement for a, uh, a, a day of yoga or international yoga day. Um, and that movement basically makes a very essentialist argument that's akin to Mahotra's argument that's also akin to the, what I call the Hindu yoga, uh, the Hindu origins position. Um, Modi portrays yoga as something that is essentially Indian um, and 
actually more than that is essentially Hindu and argues that this is an inherent part of Indian culture. And um, he, he claims a sort of ownership of authentic yoga in a way that serves to really disenfranchise other yogis. For example, Muslims practicing yoga yeah. or Christians practicing yoga or um, atheists practicing yoga. It also is tied to various social agendas. For example, um, Baba Ramdev is a common, uh, is a famous yoga teacher in India yeah. who yeah. Modi really aligns with uh, and has chosen to represent him at various yoga uh, events. And Baba Ramdev is an outspoken homophobe. Uh, who has been very politically active in disempowering LGBTQ people in India. Uh, and so yoga here is being used as a tool to subvert uh, social equity mm. in a real palpable way. Um, so I look at that, and then I also look at more what I call gestural subversion. So I look at yoga wear uh, in North America, for example, and the ways in which uh, for example, I talk about the brand Spiritual Gangster. Mm. And um, <laughs> these T-shirts uh, sort of gesture toward subversion and counterculture and anti-capitalism uh, with slogans like good vibes and good karma and, uh, you know, do good in the world. Uh, and it's 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 upsetting to me because I see here not just cultural appropriation, uh, but cultural appropriation in service to capitalism, yeah. right? Um, there's no real gesture toward equity mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, helping to serve underprivileged communities. Yeah. Uh, instead, it's just, you know, I'm making the world a better place by wearing a shirt that says I want to make a wor the world a better place. Yeah. But that's not enough. That's not that's not real activism. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm kind of problematizing the kind of binary between conservative and liberal and saying, you know, there's all sorts of liberal gestures that are or, or like gestures, gestures toward peace or multiculturalism that aren't really uh, connected to political activism. Mm. So I appreciate what you were saying about, you know, the spiritual but not religious movement being more than North American. Um, but, you know, and especially with regards to what you're talking about in India. But is there are there any other places in the world where people are using this? Because it seems I... I I remember having a conversation with a British friend of mine who remarked how the spiritual but not religious thing is like quintessentially like American and people in Britain, for example, would never say that. <laughs> um, so, you know, are we seeing this kind of a slogan of I'm spiritual, not religious um, being used in other in other cultures besides like North America and India as far uh, that you fa have found in your research? Interesting. Uh, I, I see it, especially in India. My work is focused on North America and India. Yeah. Um, and I see it, you know, it's, for example, uh, you see it throughout the rhetoric of the Modi administration um, and many of uh, his spiritual alliances, such as, again, the most popular yoga guru in India, Baba Ramdev, talks frequently about yoga being spiritual and something that can be practiced by anyone, no matter the religion, even though he will, in the next sentence, tie it to Hindu roots. Yeah. Um, and in, in an attempt, I would argue, not not as a sort of historical argument, because that's historically un, unfounded, but as a, a political attempt to privilege a certain Hindu majority um, in India. But, um, but yeah, so I see the rhetoric both in South Asia and in North America. But I also have talked to many yoga practitioners um, from uh, Western Europe who talk about spirituality all the time yeah. as a way to describe their, their practice, that yeah. yoga is spiritual. Yeah. And um, I know that some of my friends who are, for example, in um, Yoga Alliance, the largest you know, professional organization for, uh, for yoga in North America, um, they're in their attempt to sort of redefine that institution, finding that across national boundaries, yoga practitioners are describing themselves as spiritual but not religious. And they're trying to kind of think about how this affects them as an institution, a professional institution for yoga teachers. Um, 
you know, what does that mean about them as an institution and their identity and, and how they should define yoga? Mm -hmm. They're struggling with this. So I'm curious, just to go back to what you were saying about the homophobic um, yoga teacher, Baba Ram Dev. And now when he is, um, you know, uh, arguing against LGBTQ rights or however it is that uh, he's doing that, is he like citing teachings from the yoga tradition as a way of defending him? Or is it purely a kind of, you know, rhetoric? I mean, what, 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 what does he ground it in terms of the yoga teachings? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Baba Ramdev doesn't appeal specifically to yoga teachings, but he appeals to what he calls Vedic teachings. Uh, and Vedic teachings is a kind of code term yeah. in South Asian culture to talk about uh, religious authority. Yeah. Right? So um, if it's Vedic, then it's authoritative yeah. from a religious perspective. And of course, that's very problematic because there's a large Muslim population in India. Yeah. Um, you know, the Vedas are a particular set of texts that many Hindus, not even all Hindus, but many Hindus deem authoritative, but they're not deemed authoritative by all, by all South Asians yeah. and not all Indians. Uh, so uh, when, yeah, the, Baba Ramdev will talk about Vedic norms and Vedic family values, um, which are rooted in you know, a particular conception of the family as a man married to a woman. Um, but he doesn't talk specifically about yogic texts because yogic texts prior to the modern period typically didn't talk about marriage period because you know, serious practitioners of yoga renounced marriage, yeah. were celibate practitioners. Um, or if you had bhakti yoga, it was very different. Bhakti yoga, uh, devotional yoga was practiced by lay people and renouncers, but, uh, you know, in lay, but lay people were held to, 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 to social norms with regard to marriage. Uh, you know, they, the, and those were very heteronormative, mm -hmm. um, in quality. Yeah. So, you know, just to go back to this um, idea of spiritual but not religious and, um, and, and kind of the politicized uh, nature of it is, uh, you know, we've talked about kind of reimagining or reappropriating in the good way the term religion um, in, a, in a kind of one that can be more encompassing in a certain sense and, and maybe let go of these more reductive notions. Um, and then, but then you're remarking on how the spiritual but not religious um, is, is you can almost map, like you were saying, you can map like the liberal and the conservative onto it, right? Because generally the spiritual people are trying to distance themselves from organized religion, which they associate with a certain conservative group. So, it, you know, um, is that something that, you know, when you, when we kind of reimagine the term religion, what politically happens when we reimagine the term religion and, um, I'm, this isn't a very clear question, but do you have an idea of where I'm no, going? I think, gee, no, I think it's actually really important. Um, I get what you're asking. Uh, we, we Conservatives tame, tend to want to claim religion as theirs. Yeah. Right? And, and that, again, gives them authority. Yeah. Right? We're on the side of religion. Uh, but, again, historically... This is not the case. Historically, there have been as many heterodox, transgressive religious movements as there have been conservative orthodox ones. And religion is not something that is inherently conservative. Uh, religion can be something that unites communities around transgressive, sub subversive, countercultural values. Yeah. Um, and, and religion can be a real source of revolution. Mm -hmm. So I think that when you destabilize, as I, I like to put, you know, destabilize this term religion in a way that disconnects it from uh, a, a view of an institution organized hierarchically and uh, based in a, a, a very narrow set of doctrines. Once you say, well, that's not really the history of religions. You know, religions is, is much more complex, and religion can can be that, but it can also be something else. Um, then it is political uh, because you are really messing with 
the conservative claim over religion, that they own it. And in fact, I find that um, when you when scholars of religion argue with uh, right wing religious people, oftentimes the response on, on the part of the right wing is to say, well, that's not really religion. Yeah. Right. I mean, like what you're studying isn't really religion. There's really just one religion. <laughs> There's not religions. Yeah. Right. So comparing religions, studying religions at, and as a comparative project is not a legitimate project mm. because there is no such thing as religions. There's just religion mm. and everything else is wrong. Yeah. Right. And so the project itself, this, you know, to, 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 to become a scholar of religion, it's a political project yeah. Uh, yeah. that is from its from its beginning uh, undermining this sort of right wing view. Yeah. So this is sort of making me think a little bit about Wild Wild Country, which I'm hoping you've seen. I haven't. Oh, no. man. Oh, I really wanted to get your perspective on this. So we're going to have to do a follow up conversation. <laughs> okay, totally. Where we yeah. talk about Wild Wild Country, because I feel like, um, you know, especially in terms of like the politics around religion, I mean, there's so much there. And also, I'd be interested to hear, you know, when we have this kind of authoritarian, like, hyper reduced notion of what um, counts as religion, how often, you know, do those that are that are in the outside get, for example, deemed to be a cult, for example, right. you know, because it seems to me that anything that lies outside the status quo spiritually, especially when it organizes into a community, tends to be targeted as a cult. Yeah. Even if it yeah. doesn't necessarily um, uh, evident, you know, um, show the same kind of more problematic cult qualities that are associated with ones, you know, that had mass suicides or whatever. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I hope you watch that so we can talk about it. No, but maybe you have some thoughts about it now. No, but absolutely. It's very interesting because of course the tight knit communities of brown people or black people are much more likely to be labeled cult yes. than the tight knit communities of white people. Mm -hmm. Right. So if one of my students, who is a you know white middle class American, uh, goes to church on Sunday is and is surrounded by other white folk, then that student is not deemed to be participating in a cult. Right. Cult. But the minute that student uh, starts going to a group uh, once a week or twice a week, led by a brown person or surrounded by brown people, and reads those books and commits to their shared practices, then the family or community gets worried, outside community gets worried that, oh, she or he has joined a cult, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, so, of course, the way we talk about religion um, is deeply political, always. Yeah. Wow. So this has been a really fascinating conversation, Andrea. Thank you so much for talking to me about all these um, important issues. I hope this will give a lot of people um, who have been, I mean, nobody can really be um, awake and not have encountered, you know, th these discussions. And, and there's a lot of vitriol and there's a lot of um, um, not so friendly interactions around these issues. And I appreciate your, the kind of nuance um uh, nuanced way in which you uh, approach these issues. So I recommend anybody who's listening to get the book Selling Yoga uh, from Counterculture to Pop Culture. Um, Andrea, is there anything before we get off the call that you want to share with uh, those listeners? Do you have any kind of um, anything coming up, any presentations or anything you'd like to share? Um, nothing I can think of. I just say that, um, you know, I invite people to think with a lot of nuance about yoga. I don't think that yoga is one thing, yeah. right? Yoga is what yoga practitioners say it is. And, uh, there are many different types of yoga practitioners with various, uh, personal and political projects. Uh, and so I'm really excited to see, uh, you know, what, lies ahead of us. Uh, I think it's a tumultuous time politically and socially, uh, both here in the U.S., but also internationally. Um, and yoga has become this fascinating political tool yeah, that has yeah. been used in all sorts of ways. And so, yeah, I would just invite people to be alert and reflective about that. And I'll, I'm excited to see what unfolds. Yeah, that's excellent yeah, that's advice. Excellent. Thank and you so much, Andrea. You. It's been great. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, check out Wild Wild Country, and then we'll do uh, uh, we'll do uh, the sequel to this conversation. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, looking forward to it. Right, Thanks. Have a great day. You too.